All right, so horseshoe crabs and Project Womulus. Um, and um, we'll be talking a lot about horseshoe crabs. I kind of, I try to put this in some kind of flow that makes sense, but I, you may think I'm jumping around a little bit, but we'll, we'll, I'll do the best I can. I think problem is that I, I've learned so much about horseshoe crabs that it's hard to cut myself off and not be wanting to tell you all about them. Um, but I do also talk quite a bit about Project Limulus, which is a community uh, science project. And I'm promoting a lot of and do a lot of community science because I think it's a great way to introduce people to things that they're interested in and, um, and, make, and have the opportunity to get out in the field with um, scientists who are doing real work. And these community science opportunities are everywhere throughout the world, every community, you can do it by yourself uh, with online things. And um, so there is an emphasis on, on that as well as horseshoe crabs. So I'll start with just a very simple little sketch. Uh, I'm imagining that most of you are familiar with a horseshoe crab. It's basic form and it's a fairly large um, shell looks like a little tank with a long tail. And um, they, the, the front part, the carapace is called the prosoma. And then the anterior part has another word, which I just use abdomen. And of course the tail and eyes. And um, I'll talk about those as we go along. But to, there's your basic sketch and you can compare that to what you're actually seeing. Um, these are, th oh, yes, three different horseshoe crabs taken over the years. And uh, the scientific name is Limulus polyphemus. And polyphemus uh, refers to the fact that it looked like to its original namers, like it had one eye. And apparently that is the name of um, a cyclops in, I think it's the Odyssey. Now, classics are not my forte would love to be corrected on that. So um, save that information for the end because I'm sure it can be updated for me. But this is the, uh, the uh, top side um, and the underside. And here's one that's even tagged with the Project Limulus tag. So just to get down to the nitty gritty, they have lots of different parts. They have gills on the underside. Um, and they're called book gills because each one of these gills sort of lays on top of the other like the pages of a book and they can sort of furl them open, not furl them, but sort of fluff them open and close and move them like, like a gills on a fish. Unlike a fish, it can be out of water for uh, much longer than a, um, than a fish can, but they really need to keep their gills moist. So that's, if they're buried in the sand, you know, where they've gotten caught at low tide, they're usually buried just low enough that the uh, gills are staying moist uh, until the tide comes in and then they can fully submerge. And then on the uh, dorsal side, the upper side, the upper carapace, this is again, the prosoma, the head, if you will. And um, they have an eye right here, this eye. Well, actually there's a pair. Um, they actually have 10 eyes. We call them eyes, but they're not all eyes as we know them. They, their most similar is this pair of compound, uh, compound eyes, like, they, like you would see in a fly or a bee. And just to give you a sense, here it is up close. It has those little, all those little cells. And those are very important for uh, seeing. Um, and they have, uh, their eyesight is actually about a hundred times greater than ours because uh, they have a lot more co uh, cones and rods in their eyes, at, at least in terms of seeing things. Now they have a lot of other specialized eyes that are in, arranged on their head in the, in the very front part. Let me just go back a little bit. In this part, there's three eyes that are worked together and they can see UV light, um, which helps them uh, be able to distinguish between uh, reflected moonlight and sunlight. Uh, their, their spawning times are very tied to the tides and new and full moons, so that's important. 
And then they have uh, several other pairs of uh, UV receptive uh, seeing eyes, quote eyes, and also some um, photoreceptive uh, uh, spots on their tails. And again, that's just to, they can, they're not eyes like we talk about, but it can see light and dark and they're very stimulated by the amount of light in the habitat. So interesting set of uh, eyes. So, and um, I should have said right off that horseshoe crabs are not crabs. They are actually more closely related to spiders, ticks and mites. And uh, you may also know that spiders also have multiple pairs of eyes. So uh, there's one way that they uh, share in their, in their common ancestry, but they're not technically crabs, but of course they have shells, the exoskeleton shells found in the intertidal zone. So um, easily, um, you know, you just lump them in with all the other crabs, but they're, they are so unique and different in many ways. Let's see. I. So how to tell the male from the female. Uh, if you tip, flip them over and you look at the underside, if you look at this first appendage or claw on the males, this first uh, appendage here looks like a boxing glove. And it's a specially designed uh, uh, appendage claw to clasp onto the back of the female. And there it will travel behind. When the female is getting ready to lay eggs, the males are um, attracted to them. And whoever can clasp onto her and be where she is when she lays the eggs uh, is most likely to be the one whose sperm can um, fertilize the eggs. The eggs are, are fertilized external from the body. So she will lay a nest of eggs and then the, the male sperms will um, we'll find them and fertilize them in the nest. And I'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. But I'm just getting to the rudiments of how to tell a male from a female. So the males have the boxing gloves. And the females, their first appendage is more scissor-like, like, like a, a pincer, like all of the other appendages. And here's the close-up one. So not the boxing glove, because she doesn't need to hang on to anything. She just needs to... Um, uh, collect food and that's pretty much, they use these appendages for walking and for collecting food. Um, so those are the two differences. And um, I was out last night on a program and I had a couple of young kids with me and they caught on right away with the identification. So it's not too hard. So um, just another look at the ventral view. Again, here are the book gills laid back. It's hard to get a picture when, of the underside of a horseshoe crab with its tail sticking out. You can see its tail is tipped back. It's always arching backwards. So uh, I tried a lot, but very rarely do I get like the whole uh, view. But anyway. So there's the book gills again, uh, the appendages here. This is a female, it's got the uh, pincer claws up front. Uh, these really cool uh, back legs are, you can't really see it too well, but let's see, maybe I can zoom in. It has these like little flaps and they open out like your hand, like the palm of a hand. And they're near the um, anterior in the back part of the, the, of the crab. So it uses those to push along, um, push itself forward by being able to spread those, those uh, pieces of, of its claw of, uh, out, sort of like a little pushing hand. But what's really interesting is that here is its mouth and it's a grinding kind of uh, mouth. So the, the animal is going along the, the surface of the uh, substrate, the sandy bottom. And it's using, especially, there's two little smaller pincers right here. They're sort of using, if you just think of a very hungry adolescent boy where he's using every hand he possibly can to be shoveling food into that mouth, that's what's happening here. So she's going on, or it, it, she or he is going along and they're using these to grab food, which would be, oh, little snails or shells, um, uh, phytoplankton, which are, um, 
uh, vegetation, but also zooplankton, little shrimp and things like that. And they're putting in this grinding machine, basically a meat grinder. Uh, and then of course, it's so it's kind of prickly. Things don't fall out. Once they go in, they go in and that is going directly into the stomach. So that is the mouth. They do not bite. You cannot, uh, it would be pretty hard to stick your finger in there on purpose, let alone accidentally get bitten. They don't bite. The tail is not a stinger. And in, in fact, uh, it's called a telson. It's a very important uh, uh, limb, really. It has a ball and socket joint. So this joint right here is a ball and socket, like your hip. And if um, it gets flipped over in the surf, which does happen, um, you know, especially at the shoreline, it can arc back like it's doing now in this picture and use that tail to pivot itself around and get itself upright again. If it loses its tail, it's probably gonna lose its life because it loses its ability to right itself in the right right direction. So never, 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 never pick up a horseshoe crab by its tail and you don't need to be worried about it. It's not a stinger. It's not going along the, so the bottom with the tail stuck up trying to stab your foot. The tail is always dragging along behind it. So, um, so um, I'm going to jump just a little bit to talk about Project Limulus. Um, this is a, a community-based research program that was, uh, that's led out of um, Sacred Heart University down in Fairfield, Connecticut. It's been going for tw uh, 24 years now. It started in 1998. And uh, uh, the woman who leads this is uh, Dr. Jennifer Matai. Um, and she's been studying, she and her group, her students and the group have been studying um, the ecology of the horseshoe crab in Long Island Sound. <clears throat> and uh, six years ago in 2015, I contacted her about, uh, well, making the, the case that Block Island was at the tip of Long Island Sound and couldn't we be involved in this research? And she was delighted. She gives me whenever she can um, between 25 and 50 horseshoe crab tags each spawning season, which we're right in the middle of now um, for um, collecting and tagging the animals. And they use that information because we see tags come back um, and we can get lots of information, just like banding a bird about how long the animal lives, where it may have gone, um, whether or not it has grown. If you get a chance to uh, measure uh, a tag horseshoe crab, you may find something about um, whether or not it grows <clears throat> at, at, the, at that stage in its life. Um, and even if you don't get to measure it and do all those things, just recording the, the number in contacting Project Limulus, and I'll show you that on a tag in a few moments, um, is a really big help. And we've had, I've found a, not I, but somebody has found a, a tag horseshoe crab in the Great Salt Pond that was originally tagged in uh, South Carolina. And one of our horseshoe crabs that was tagged here has been found in uh, Groton, Connecticut. So they do move around a bit, but they're really not, one of the things they're trying to find out is how much they move around and how, um, whether or not there's a lot of overlap and intermingling between the populations or whether or not they're fairly segregated. So uh, more on that. So uh, again, uh, it's very much a community science approach. This couldn't happen with the lots of work throughout um, Connecticut and Long Island shorelines. Um, and of course now here, so. Uh, the spawning activities, when the female is coming forward to the shoreline to lay eggs, uh, happens around the new and full moons in May and June at high tide. So uh, on this particular night, we had the full moon, which you can see up there over the heads. And uh, so it wasn't really night. And we were, um, we have lots of people helping collect the data, examine the the animals, and then ultimately we will release them. And they go scurrying along with their white Project Limulus tag. Whenever you pick up a horseshoe crab or are carrying it, this is the proper way. You, you turn it over uh, and you, usually it's better if the tail is facing away from you, unless you're trying to show it to somebody, in which case I usually try to have the tail facing towards me, but you carry it like a bowl of rice. And um, it's safe, you're not 
uh, putting any um, pressure on its appendages or tail. And if you're taking it, you know, to, if you're if it's out of the water for more than you know five minutes or so, you just sort of dunk it every once in a while and make sure that it's uh, keeping hydrated. Uh, but they're rarely out of the water for that long um, when we're doing our work. I do take a bucket along and try to keep, if I'm getting backed up in horseshoe crabs, which is a nice problem to have, um, I have a bucket of, of uh, water that we keep them refreshed in until their turn is ready. So love to have all of the help and it, you can almost be any age uh, and be thrilled with helping with the um, uh, survey work. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the protocol, so right now we're in uh, this, um, the spawning time around uh, the moon, which is tomorrow. And, um, and for the life of me, I'm just suddenly going, yeah, it's a, it's a new, a full moon, I think. I can't remember if we're in the full moon or the new moon. Um, it's all blending to me. Anyway, somebody can remind me later. Anyway, I think it's, I think uh, it's the new moon, Kim. Looking Thank you. <laughs> I, it's kind of what I thought, but then I questioned myself. Anyway, the, uh, Project Limulus, everybody who's working on this does, a, does surveys uh, at the high tides two days before the, the, the moon, in our case, the new moon, on the day of the new moon and two days after and at high tide. So that gives you uh, usually a daytime high tide and a nighttime high tide. Generally right now, um, the nighttime high tides are a little higher, so they tend to be a little better. But, um, and the protocol is that you ex examine your stretch and our stretch is from the beginning of Andes Way Beach to where it sort of opens up into what I call the stream where you're sort of run out of uh, sand. Um, and it's three meters and we have a little three meter line and we get people to, um, measure that and we walk down the beach and we observe every horseshoe crab that we see in that three meter stretch. And I will say that most of the time when I do this, there are few to none, but sometimes, um, uh, but usually there are horseshoe crabs out at further about, and this is what our scout is doing out here, looking for horseshoe crabs that, because I can tag anything, but the cert, there's two parts of the project. One is the survey, what's actually happening uh, at the shoreline at the same time that everybody is looking at the shoreline throughout uh, the Long Island Sound area. And then the other part is tagging animals and getting them into the ecosystem with tags so that they have possibility of being found. So I usually, it's great when I have extra helpers. Um, so I can have one group helping me keep track, um, which is what these young guys are doing, what's happening at the shoreline. And then people who are dressed for waiting uh, can go on Rove and see what they can bring back to us. And uh, it was just a, a beautiful evening. If you spend any time at Andy's Way, you're probably used to being there at low tide. So this probably looks like a foreign view because here the kayaks are up on the, and the, the, uh, the water is right up to them. And this isn't even as high as it sometimes gets. But I love this particular photo, uh, especially this person peering in, trying to see what is down there. So if you're lucky, you might find a single horseshoe crab in that three meter zone. This is one that was, and, and sometimes the water is very smooth and calm. Obviously this is one that was tagged. There's the little lim limulus tag and it's swimming away. Sometimes you're lucky enough to see two that are uh, on the move. So they haven't, she hasn't buried in to start laying her eggs, but they, she's looking for a spot. She's the forward one. And then the one attached behind, trailing behind is the male. So here's two that are swimming in the water and um, they're fairly close to the shore, which you can sort of determine because here's the little break. The, uh, the, of the wave. Now, this is no surfer's wave. This is less than six inches. So we're not very far from the edge of the, of the shoreline. And sometimes you find a lot. This happens about, it, it happens many times during the spawning season. It happens to coincide with, I'm actually doing a survey about once a season. A lot depends on water temperature, wave action, um, whether or not it's rainy or cloudy or foggy or not uh, at the appointed time. Uh, so sometimes, 
So it happens just enough that you can see these great clusters of them that uh, you keep doing it. But a lot of times you just find one or two. And um, when you find a cluster like this, usually the bottom of these pig piles is one female who's buried in and all the rest are males. There's one attached to her. And then all of the others are in the same area uh, trying to get the chance to fertilize those eggs. Um, and they have done uh, testing of a nest of eggs and found that multiple males will be able to fertilize the eggs in uh, one nest. And they call it a nest, it's not a nest like a bird nest. It's a, it's, a, it's a hollowed out depression in the sand where she lays her egg in the sand and the water just covered right back up. They give more like a turtle nest. Um, but so sometimes you're lucky enough to see that. Uh, sometimes this was just this year, uh, we had three. So this is the female starting to bury herself in. Uh, this is the male that's attached. And here's the second male who's attached to the first male. I guess he's going for the ride and hoping that he'll have at least some of his, uh, his generation uh, continued. Um, and again, sometimes you get really big. Uh, this, in this case, this was a couple of years ago, there were two females and you really can't tell, but we were able to, uh, you know, you can't tell from the photo, but at, on site, you could tell that there were two females in this cluster and all the rest of these are males. Um, and they're all trying to be at the right spot at the right time. So um, this was last year um, on one of those great days. It's not the greatest photo because it's a little dark. It was a nighttime high tide, but all of these lumps, these are all horseshoe crabs right at the, uh, at the um, shoreline break as, as well as mixing up here. There's quite a bit of seaweed that day. Um, and I'll tell you, I think Andy's Way is one of the most beautiful spots on the island, and it really doesn't matter almost what time of day or what you see or what you don't see. It's a magical place, and it was a beautiful evening that night. Um, and then here's an interesting photo because you get an idea. This is the female. This is the abdomen part. Remember the prosoma or the, uh, the front part, the head part is way out here, and you can see how the sand is domed up. She's buried way in and she is laying the eggs up underneath her about this area. And there's the males sticking by trying to be there and deposit their sperm at the same time that she deposits the eggs. She can lay in the course of one season about 300,000 eggs a season. They don't become reproductive until they're about eight to 10 years old and a horseshoe crab can live to about 20 years. So that is a lot of horseshoe crab eggs that get laid in the lifetime, in the reproductive lifetime of a horseshoe crab. And uh, not very many of them have to survive to another horseshoe crab to, um, to maintain the population. So as you'll learn soon, uh, those eggs are used for lots of other things. This is the uh, tagging process for Project Limulus. Um, first thing you do is uh, I have a special awl here. It's got a little stop so I don't go too far. Uh, this was my able-bodied assistant, Austin, yesterday, just last night doing this one. Um, and you drill a hole. The carapace, the upper and lower parts of the shell are like, um, they're chitin, they're like your fingernail. They're only much harder and Inside between those two shells is what's called an open circulatory system. Uh, there's no tissue and there's no nerves. It's like a piercing, right? So you're just putting a hole uh, through the shell and it comes out to the other side. Um, and then you have a tag, which looks like uh, the disc with, um, uh, and it's plastic, lightweight plastic, and it has a plastic stem that is like a ringed nail if anybody's done construction. So it has ridges. So once it's in there, um, it does not come out um, generally. I've, it's very difficult to, to get one out. Uh, so you, you make the hole, then you put the uh, tag on it. it. Does not, again, it does not hurt them. Um, and then you take some measurements uh, with these calipers. This is the best investment I ever made because while you're doing this, the feet and tail are moving all the time. 
And to do this with a straight ruler is very difficult. It's always getting shoved out of the way. But if we have an extra big pair of calipers and you measure the widest part of the shell. And uh, as I will probably say many, many, many more times, the more help we can get, the better. And it really, uh, age is not a factor. Um, this young man was learning how to, uh, to count centimeters on a, uh, on a um, pair of calipers. It was great. And then it's tagged. Uh, again, couldn't get that tail to stick down for the beautiful Photoshop. Here's its eye. This is a very clean shell. A lot of times they have other things on them. Um, and then you do the release. And um, this was another outing I had earlier um, this season with um, some uh, kids that I work with. I've been able to work with in connection with the library. They're preschool age kids and uh, they were helping me with the, uh, with the uh, Project Limulus. And they had a great time. Who doesn't wanna be in the water at Andy's Way delivering a horseshoe crab back to its, its place? And uh, here's that threesome just for the fun of it. You can see how it's moving along here. I'll try to, and it's, that, this is before they settled in. She's still in the water. She's dragging along that one male. The other male is trying to get along for the ride. And you notice how it's plowing up that sort of that pathway. If you go to Andy's Way this time of year at low tide, if you go out, to where the uh, tide leaves the sand um, covered, uncovered, you'll see these great sort of circular swooping paths. And those are all the paths of the horseshoe crabs, the uh, females that have been dragging themselves up to lay their eggs in the warm sand um, and the males behind them. And uh, that there, uh, the design is art and it without anything else. So. So that's how they kind of move along and plow themselves under. Oops. So here's some tags that we reclaimed over the years. Um, actually, um, you look at the, uh, the first three numbers on the tags is the series. So I can tell from my records, for instance, 371 were tags that I put out in 2017, 399 uh, tags I put out in 2018. Um, and 347, oh, that's 347. I didn't read that correctly. Um, so, I, and the legend here, I wrote 342, but now I can see with my glasses on and it's a little bigger, it's 347. And 347 were tags I put out in 2015. So this is a animal that was in the first year that I was tagging them. Um, this one was not, this one when I believe was found last year, uh, these other two were found this year already. So you can just take a photo and you can go to the website on it. Um, you could go to the project uh, for the US Fish and Wildlife Service and report the tag number, or you can um, go to Project Limulus and they have a place where you can report tag numbers, or you can take a photo and send it to me and I'll, I'll um, send it on to where it needs to go. And if it's one of my tags, I can tell you specifically uh, when uh, when I tagged it. So keep an eye out for those tags. And uh, in the day of, of uh, camera uh, phone cameras, pretty easy, just snap a picture and don't drop the phone in the water, but keep on going and send it back. So uh, there can be as many as 23 different species can live in the ecosystem of a horseshoe crab. There are barnacles, and uh, lots of slipper shells, shrimp, seaweed. Um, this, this one has lots of slipper shells on them. Sometimes they're stacked up pretty high and they're just there on their, they, they are a moving ecosystem. They're not really hurting the horseshoe crab unless one of the barnacles or slipper shell happens to land over the eye. Uh, that can definitely uh, hinder the crab, uh, the horseshoe crab. But uh, for the most part, they're not physically damaging. Um, however, this year they've started asking me to look, asking everybody in Project Limulus to look for something called flat worms, which I hardly ever see. Um, and you can see it, they tend to be around where the legs are attached. And there's a little one right there. And here it is right here close. It looks like 
to my eye, it looks like little pieces of white rice, but if you look at them long enough, you'll see they're moving. I think they're trying to, I've, this is the first year that I know of that they're looking for those. To, so whether or not they're trying to ascertain how prevalent they are or if they're a detriment to the animal, um, I actually haven't gotten updated on why we're looking for them just yet, but we are. Um, and then things happen. You could find horseshoe crabs in all kinds of predicaments. This was a few years ago, horseshoe crab, we found with a very bent tail. Sometimes half of the telson is, is gone. Sometimes a, an appendage would be broken off. Uh, in this case, uh, this, this horseshoe crab accidentally got its one, one of its front feet, or no, I guess that's the back foot. It's probably its pushing foot uh, into a, a quahog, a, a clam shell. And that's a live clam stuck onto that, that foot. And I can't remember, I think we did get it off, but I think I had to break the clam um, to, to get it off. So, and I've seen that twice now. So I, I suspect that happens more often than we think. And sometimes when we find a horseshoe crab that's missing an appendage, I always sort of wonder, hmm, I wonder if it ran into a, a clam. And of course that this particular clam was pretty small. So um, a larger clan could probably, um, you know, it would be my foot on my life. So to give up the foot. So as I say, things happen. Now, when you're puncturing uh, the carapace for the, um, for the tag, you put a little hole in there. This happens to be a female, which are generally much bigger. Uh, and again, the open circulatory system means that they don't have blood vessels and things like that. They're in the between the two parts of the shell, the upper and the lower, it's uh, just an open system of blood. And this is her blood uh, coming out. And here's a close up of it, the blood. And also mixed in with that blood are all these eggs. These are little tiny eggs that are also coming out at the time until I put the, um, the tag in, which acts as a stopper. But you do get a little bit of leaking blood. Now you'll notice the color of the blood is kind of bluish. Uh, the basics, the structure for horseshoe crab blood is copper, uh, and thus their blood is sort of blue colored. Uh, in humans and most mammals that we know of, their blood is red, and that's because it's, it's based on iron. Um, so that, but that's not the most unique thing about the uh, horseshoe crab's blood. The other thing is that it has an amoeba site, um, which is a specialized cell. Um, that reacts to bacteria. So if a horseshoe crab gets an injury, the amoebocyte, um, uh, again, will we'll go to that area uh, right away where the bacteria is. And it will cover that bacteria with this sort of viscous kind of gel-like substance and seal it off so that the bacteria can't take hold. It can't spread and go throughout uh, the body. And to my knowledge, I, I believe I, this is, has not been disproven yet. Um, uh, infection, bacterial infection is not known in horseshoe crabs because this amoeba site is so effective at recognizing and sealing off bacteria from, from getting hold. So you'll often see horseshoe crabs with, you know, missing a part of a leg, a part of its tail or a ding in its, um, in its uh, carapace. And uh, it is not a site for infection because of the uh, amoeba site. Now, um, the medical industry has uh, put, taken that, put that to good use starting at around, I think it was discovered in 1960, but since, since the 1980s has been used quite a bit. And they developed from that amoeba site, from the blood that's associated with the blood of the horseshoe crab, a substance called limulus amoeba site lysate. Um, and that is a, a substance that is used for testing the purity of, of uh, drugs and other medical devices. So if you've had a flu shot, if you've had a COVID vaccine, you have benefited from the blood of a horseshoe crab. Um, and uh, LAL is, is very important um, to the pharmaceutical and the medical uh, biomedical industry. It's also uh, used for things that are put into your body things like pacemakers and artificial knees and uh, lots of things, wherever you're going to be invasive 
the substance or the apparatus is uh, often tested with the LAL, which is coming from the horseshoe crab blood. Now, um, I won't go too political here, but uh, they have, there has been development, especially by um, some European scientists to synthetic LAL so that you don't have to harvest, uh, collect horseshoe crabs and then collect their blood, which um, they're only allowed to take 30% of the blood and then they can put the crab back. They're required to put the horseshoe crab back and it's in the environment that it came from, not a similar one, the one. So uh, most harvesters, horseshoe crabs are harvested for uh, two reasons. One as bait for um, uh, eel pots or uh, conch or whelk pots. And um, they're harvested by, uh, for uh, delivery to biomedical companies to harvest the, the blood for making the LAL. Um, I'm sure the day that right now in this country, I think it's, uh, I believe it's Eli Lilly, I was reading a paper on this yesterday, is the only pharmaceutical company now that is using the synthetic. And I, I'm sh I hope um, that they will be moving um, towards that. They've proven that there's um, that identical uh, efficacy and there's when you can make a synthetic, although it might be more expensive than paying the fishermen to collect and return a, a horseshoe crab, um, it's, there is a, a loss to the horseshoe crab, a certain percentage are lost in that process. And um, it's just gonna be better to use the synthetic. Um, in um, some parts of the world, I should have said there, there were, when I first studied these, there were five uh, known species of horseshoe crabs in the world. There are now four. Um, and uh, there's the American horseshoe crab, which is what I'm talking about and showing that exists on the East Coast of the United States. Um, and then the other three are one in Japan, one in India, and one in Indonesia. And the fifth one that I learned about originally has gone extinct. And there's one, uh, the, um, according to the International Union for Concerned um, Scientists that rate, um, uh, list a uh, uh, species concern level, um, the American horseshoe crab is considered uh, stable, but under watch. Uh, the Japanese horseshoe crab is endangered. It's on the red list. And the other two are uh, probably going to be red listed. So the, the species, the numbers, these are endangered uh, critters. Ours here in America um, is not, uh, not yet considered endangered, but it is under watch. Um, and I don't have the right word, but it's the word that I should be using means it's under watch. Anyway, there I digress a little bit on their blood. It's totally fascinating. It does gel up. The reason I'm showing it on this ruler is that um, it pooled and then it gelled. And that's because of the amoeba site. It doesn't continue to flow. Um, it's like a little, like, if you ever played with Elmer's glue in your life, it kind of felt like that. So we have uh, lots of baby horseshoe crabs. We have a very healthy ecosystem for horseshoe crabs on Black Island, mostly in Andy's way, but also in Cormorant Cove, um, in the harbor ponds, uh, anywhere where there's a little bit of a shallow bench, um, a shallow uh, shoreline, um, you can, and the sand, they, they don't lay so well in the rocky intertidal. So they like to have a sandy surface. So these are some tiny ones. They start off really small. These are not as small as they get. This is a large man's hand. This is a small woman's hand. You can see the difference in size um, of these horseshoe crab babies, juveniles. It takes several years to get that. Here's one, uh, just looking at both sides. It's an exact replica. Uh, it is exactly like a, um, an adult horseshoe crab, except that the males, um, the first uh, appendage on the males looks like a pincer until it has what it's called its terminal molt, the last time it molts. And that's when it gets its boxing glove um, uh, appendage because that's when it's ready to be reproductive. Um, so, which does not happen until eight to 10 years. So the horseshoe crab has eight to 10 years of growing before it's considered reproductive. 
Um, and each time they do that, they have to um, molt. Here's a part of, we do a juvenile horseshoe crab uh, survey throughout the summer where we'll look at a certain area for a certain time and measure every juvenile we can find. And they range in these sizes uh, up until this point, anything that's this size, 4.3, um, I believe these are millimeters, if I recall correctly. Um, they are, oops, back we go. They are considered year, uh, young of the year. The next three from 10 to 15 is a one year old. Roughly, there's some variation, but roughly from 21.7 uh, to 36.3 is a three year old. And, or did I skip one? Two year old, sorry. And these last two, this is a three year old. And this is this particular one is about a four year old crab, um, a juvenile horseshoe crab. And the way they grow is by molting. So when you're at Andy's Way or anywhere around the Great Salt Pond and you find these beautiful sort of tan, tawny, very lightweight uh, horseshoe crab uh, skeletons, uh, that is the is the molt. It's not a dead animal. And what happens is, um, it's a, since it's an exoskeleton, the, the, the animal cannot grow uh, because the shell is too hard. So when it's ready to grow, it's grown inside, it's, it pushes its way out of its shell. Uh, and you can see in the right here, the, the car upper carapace and the lower shell separate. And the new animal crawls out of that spot and it already has a rubberized shell, uh, which it then pumps up with water. So it expands it as big as it can and then it hardens in its new shell. But it has a lot of room to grow. It's like buying a young, uh, a kid, uh, a pair of sh shoes too big so that they can grow into them. And that's what happens with uh, horseshoe crabs. Um, so they leave behind this tiny replica of themselves, which is a molt. Um, and uh, so they're not dead crabs. And I'm, I'm so, people are so relieved when I, when I tell them that. All right. And here, uh, I, I've found this, I think, three times in my life when looking for juvenile horseshoe crabs, I've actually found one in the process of molting. So here's the old shell at the top. And here's the new animal coming, pushing its way out. And it's kind of like a snake will shed its skin. It's going to be pushing against some of the rough sand, the surface of the bottom. And, and it just basically crawls out of its shell and leaves it behind and walks away and uh, pumps up that shell. And it has room to grow for another year or so. Um, and, and by the way, uh, lobsters uh, uh, do the same thing. You've heard of a soft shell lobster, crabs, the same thing. Anything that has an exoskeleton that can expand as the animal grows needs to have a way of um, shedding that shell and uh, getting a new shell and then um, growing into that so that it can grow. So I'm sure you've all heard of soft shell blue crab or soft shell lobsters. Um, that's what's happening. They're newly uh, molted. So where do these little tiny horseshoe crab juveniles come from? Well, they come from the eggs that are laid um, by the female. This is a, a little nest of eggs. Uh, this is blown up hugely, but you can see that they look like little, uh, little peas or BBs. They're about the size of a BB. Um, um, especially this one, they're a little green, about the size of a BB, right in the sand. You can see that this is actually very fine sand. So this is hugely magnified, very difficult to find these. But who can find them? Shorebirds can find them. And um, the red knot, which is the bird in the center of this photo, is well known for its uh, uh, northward migration from South America to up to the uh, shorelines of uh, upper Canada, the great uh, wetlands of Canada. And they have one big stopover, where, and that's the Chesapeake Bay area and anywhere in between. But the sort of the epicenter is the Chesapeake Bay, uh, which is also the epicenter of the American horseshoe crab population. There are more horseshoe crabs in that area than anywhere else along the coast. And then it, as you radiate from that, the population numbers uh, decrease. And that's where these shorebirds stop 
stop to feed and they find these nests, they're very high in protein and fat, each one of these little eggs, and they build it up for enough fuel uh, resources to finish their migration, which is still another couple thousand miles to go. Um, and it's not just the red knot, although that is uh, well known and written about many shorebirds. This is a Dunlin. These are some sandpipers. These are all uh, feeding uh, on horseshoe crab eggs. And I mentioned earlier how many they produce. Only one of those has to survive to produce uh, to a reproductive age to, to replace the female that laid it. So all the rest of those eggs are part of the food web and uh, very important. This, uh, this animal, and I should have mentioned this way earlier, has been on earth uh, for at least 300 million years. Um, and they've, that's given a long time for a lot of other ecosystems to adapt and to um, work in concert with their presence. So um, it's a very ancient um, sort of innate thing that happens of the shorebirds feeding on the horseshoe crab, crab eggs. Uh, 300 million years is, um, means that the horseshoe crabs have survived five mass extinctions on earth, including the uh, the extinction that led to the uh, dinosaurs uh, demise. In other words, horseshoe crabs were around with the dinosaurs were here. Um, the last uh, ice ages is survived. Um, and I guess the question for us today is, will horseshoe crabs survive the mass extinction that we're experiencing right now, the sixth extinction? Lots of study goes on about these, um, these animals and their ecosystems. They have a high tolerance for temperature. They are ranging from north in the American horseshoe crab ranges from um, uh, uh, Maine, cold waters of Maine, all the way down into uh, um, uh, Florida, part of the Gulf uh, states, so very warm water. Uh, and Project Limulus is not the only uh, study. Um, there are many U.S. fish and wildlife related studies of horseshoe crabs and their life cycles, their animals and their ecosystems and what their uh, environment needs to sustain them. Uh, this is some work, this is just an image to illustrate the work that started uh, last year by a woman named Natalie Amaral. She's working with the Rhode Island DEM Marine Fisheries. Uh, and she is studying horseshoe crab populations in Rhode Island, Southern New England. And what, sh what she's looking at among other things, but uh, primarily is whether or not um, she's taking a biological sample so she can test the DNA and see if each population is distinct or if there's a lot of overlapping in the DNA. In other words, more mixing between the populations. Uh, and that's codes uh, that's, um, that's, that's adding to the information that's also being studied at, um, with Project Limulus. So uh, this is um, Dee Verbest, our Great Salt Pond scientist and last summer's um, marine assistant, Ty Gonia, and a uh, big collaboration uh, with the Nature Conservancy and DEM on fisheries in general, and in specific on um, horseshoe crabs. So it'd be interesting to find out when this study concludes, is Black Island's population really distinct or is there a wide mixing with say the population in Matunic or Narragansett Bay or Long Island Sound? So all kinds of ongoing research. Um, we are about to celebrate International Horseshoe Crab Day on June 20th. So get out there on June 20th and observe and honor the horseshoe crab. Uh, Jennifer, uh, Dr. Matai is a co-chair of this and her, uh, the other co-chair is a professor in Japan and they work very closely to bring awareness uh, around the world to the plight of horseshoe crabs and their value in society, both ecologically and um, for medical human needs. So, and uh, thank you, but also, we couldn't do any of this work without collaboration between organizations and without community scientists like you who are willing to get out there, care, help, hold the other end of the ruler, hold the animal while we're trying to measure it, 
go walk about in deeper water looking for animals to tag and just generally become informed and uh, good citizens and good scientists and good community members. So thank you to some of these folks. I love working at this program uh, with, with people. Um, people in nature, uh, you can't look, you know, they're not two separate things. They are one thing and we need to keep that in mind. And with that, I guess I'll unshare my screen and uh, take any questions. Uh, let's see, stop share, there we go. Okay, so I've asked, I think I've asked people to unmute themselves if they uh, okay. <laughs> have a question, but that was great, Kim. That was, uh, that was fascinating. I have a couple of questions if, um, if no one else has a question, but you said so you showed the picture of um, sort of like when you were penetrating the sh the um, the shell and there were yeah. um, eggs. You said they yeah. were leaking. Were they leaking out of of the hole that I had made with the all? Okay, so, so they're the kind of like they're stuff. within that within yeah. that shell layer. There, yeah, within they're... in the shell between the upper and lower shell, it's just open space and it's filled it's, with this okay. blood, and that's where her eggs are, and it's all mixed together. So it's all mixed together, the blood and the eggs and yeah, everything. And um, so yeah, and okay. it doesn't it doesn't bleed much, but there's a lot of pressure there. So if she hasn't laid any eggs yet. Uh, that, that can, you can feel also, you'll pick up a female and it can feel very heavy compared mm. to say another female. And that's because it is just filled with uh, blood and eggs that haven't yet been deposited. And if you puncture that, sometimes it'll actually even spurt out a little bit. You mm -hmm. can quickly put in the, um, the plug of the, of the uh, tag and it stops that right away. But whereas when the males, when you, um, when you puncture that shell, a little bit might ooze out, but it's not a flow like it would be with a female because there's so much pressure to get those eggs out. Yeah. Okay. No, that was very cool. And um, also interesting with the DNA work with DEM, and then, and then they're now collaborating with Project Limulus too. So that's yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah. So if anyone has any questions, they can put them in the chat or. Um, Oh, we have some things here. So if someone asked about the recordings of the Zooms. Um, so I put it, so all, you know, as I, we mentioned, these are recorded and then we post them on a YouTube site, which um, I link through the website, natureblockisland.org. It's a site where we keep all our program information, all the different programs Kim's doing. You know, it has all the Project Limulus dates. So if you're on the island and you want to know um, when Kim's do, um, tagging horseshoe crabs, have a look at that. And all the recordings are also on there. So if you search, if you look through, there's a whole section on Kim's Zooms and you can see all the recordings of previous ones. And uh, Polly was asking about the improvements to the path at Andy's Way this summer. Kim, do you know anything about that? I haven't heard any um, updates. I it was they were trying to get it done by this summer obviously that that's not going to happen we are we are at this summer <laughs> yeah we are but, um, i'm sure they I, i've been following it at the town level and um they had to get their zoning and their planning permissions and the so i be, i believe the plan is to start that right after the summer so that um the path will be improved and it'll be a a boardwalk type path that will not be rutted and sandy and slippery and like running a gauntlet of poison ivy it's true it's a very difficult path but um, <laughs> it will be improving and not only will it be improving physically uh with the boardwalk which i think is pretty important it's going to be one of the few beaches where it's easy for someone who's um does isn't as mobile as say i might be to get down there and that day is probably coming and I'm going to look forward to the day when I can go down there in my wheelchair on that path. So yeah, I think it's coming, but it's probably not going to be ready this summer, but yeah, take your time. Great. Kim, there was another couple questions in the chat. How do they actually lay the eggs? Is there an ovipositor? Am I saying uh, that? Ovipositor? Um, that is an excellent question. There must be a vent somewhere. I'm writing that down. 
I don't know exactly what the ORF is, but it's got to be an orifice of some sort where, okay. or an ovipositor, just like an insect that has uh, for, for depositing eggs. But, um, and I will try to answer that question, figure out how to append it to the, um, when we uh, put the uh, recording up. Well, so. also, I, you know, it's, I see it's, it's Nancy Ruddle who's asked the question, so okay. we could try to follow up with her if Great. we can't. Oh, that might be beyond my technology. Uh, turn it <laughs> at okay. the end of the Zoom. And she was also asking, um, how do the crabs swim? Surprise how far they travel. Yeah, they um, they pretty much use their feet and they walk. They walk uh, but it. the wow. propulsion of their 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 they do get some forward momentum momentum by fanning their gills. But not much. It's mostly they're they're very buoyant, really, because they're in that open carapace. They're not so buoyant that they're floating, but they're buoyant enough that you know they can give a little push off and go far. And if you ever see one at uh, Andy's way, when we put it back in the at the surf break, again, it's not a ten foot surf break; it's a six inch surf break. But they plow right through it and have a lot of forward momentum and go really quickly. But they are they're walking. Mm -hmm. And let me just I, I will say I have um, we are right in the middle of this series of uh, horseshoe crab tagging and surveying. So I have a program Thursday morning at eight and Thursday evening at eight thirty and Saturday morning at ten. And if you want to sign up, uh, you can let me know. Okay, great. Any questions anyone wants to ask? Um, so Kim, looking forward, you have another Zoom on Nature June 21st, correct? And that's right. at the Enchant a walk in the Enchanted Forest. Right. Um, that's the end of this series of the of the two a month and then starting um the following week kim is starting um some limited in-person programs and also starting in july another zoom on nature series and this is around the great salt pond it's going to be thursday it's, it's going to be a half an hour like a little bit shorter is that the idea mm -hmm. yes thursday mornings I want to say nine o'clock. We'll, we'll 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 post all this, but it's just going to focus around the Great Salt Pond. So I just want to give people a heads up. I think that's kind of interesting. It's going to really. Right. And I'll just say a little more about that for anybody mm -hmm. who's ever uh, is at all familiar. I used to do a walk called the Great Salt Pond Stroll in two days, and we would basically walk around the perimeter of the Great Salt Pond, starting at Andy's Way and eventually ending at Andy's Way. And along the way, I would talk about the natural history that we're seeing, the, the, the physical substrate, a lot of historical sites, a lot of cultural sites. Um, and it was a fun kind of walk stroll, but it takes, it would take about because of all the stopping and going and um, about three hours a day. So uh, this year I'm going to be doing that walk as a Zoom uh, one part at a time. For instance, the first day we'll be covering the area from Andy's Way to um, Harris Point. I think it's Harris Point. Can't remember. <laughs> anyway, you get the idea. We're going to be doing sections by sections, and by the end of the seventh uh, program, we will have circumnavigated um, the Great Salt Pond, and there'll be included information with all the different organizations that are doing work to keep the Great Salt Pond great. Uh, the Harbors Department, the town, um, the Shellfish Commission, uh, Black Island Maritime Institute, the Committee for the Great Salt Pond, the Nature Conservancy is old and work there. So um, uh, we, I'll be leafing in all that information uh, as well as the, as the environmental and natural history. And a few old time stories that I can't vouch for the validity of, but they're fun. Okay, great. Okay, Kim, well, I think with that, I think, you know, it was so informative. I don't think there was anything left 
uh, no stone unturned, no horseshoe crab unturned. On, on, on you have that. to say that as I went along, I kept thinking, oh, I should have said this, but it's hard to remember everything. So, so if there are questions, just let us know. And I will check out about exactly where do those eggs come out? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, that's awesome, Kim. So hope everyone joins us on June 21st for the Enchanted Forest. And then again, if you're on island, Kim's doing some limited in-person programs, mostly starting in July, a little bit that last week in June to July, but um, yeah. Great. Great. See y'all. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Thank Thanks you so much.